This chapter, the story of Thomas Alva Edison, Let There Be Light. The miracle of glittering modern cities, of shining electric light. The world owes this and more to Thomas Edison. The filament of the first structural incandescent lamp which I invented was of carbonized cotton thread. In the search for a better filament, I carbonized everything lightly. Carbonized paper horseshoe lamps were used in the first public demonstration of the electric lighting system in Menlo Park on December 31st, 1879. This uh, is a replica of the, one of the first uh, cotton thread lamps. Said Edison of his invention of the phonograph, First words, I spoke in the original phonograph. A little piece of practical poetry. Mary had a little lamb, its fleet was quite as slow, and everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. <laughs> the Edison story began in a little house in Milan, Ohio. The boy's inventive genius showed early. He had a laboratory in the cellar when he was 10 years old. During the Civil War, when he was 15, Edison was a newsboy on the railroad. The war reached into every town and home. Folks waited daily at the railroad station for Tom and the train to come in, bringing news of the fighting. Peace came and telegraph lines began spreading across the land. Fascinated by the new invention, Edison went to work putting up telegraph lines. He was 17 years old. Leaving home, he worked for four years as a telegraph operator in various Midwest cities and tinkered with the instruments to improve them. In 1869, Edison came to New York City penniless looking for a job. It was a time of hardship. Then he invented a stock ticker, the forerunner of the ticker machines used in modern stock exchanges. The invention netted Edison $40,000. He was comparatively wealthy and in love. Mary Stilwell became his wife. At Menlo Park, New Jersey, he embarked on his career as a full-fledged inventor was a period of tremendous creative activity. One of its highlights was the invention of the first talking machine. The phonograph was an international sensation. It brought Edison fame and a nickname, Wizard of Menlo Park. Every mechanical problem was a challenge. Edison's improvements made the typewriter a practical writing machine. The telephone was invented simultaneously by Edison and Bell. Now you tackled the greatest challenge of all, the electric light. Previous research, you felt, had been on the wrong track. You sketched incandescent lamps, experimented with them, trying to find a filament that would burn brightly and have long life. Thousands of materials were tried and rejected. Your co-workers gave up hope. Stubbornly, you went on, and after a year of superhuman labor, success. You announced a daring project to bring electric light to the downtown district of New York. All the intricate machinery of the first power station had to be invented and built by you. There were no precedents. But finally, everything was ready for the turning of the main switch on the control board. Electric street lamps burning for the first time in history. The age of electricity had arrived. Soon, horse-drawn trolley cars disappeared. In their place, electric trolleys invented by Edison. Electric lines carried power to city and rural homes. Evil-smelling gas lamps with a flip of the switch were abolished. 
The invention of the electric light, the harnessing of electric power had changed the face of the earth. But for Thomas Edison, it was only the beginning. Now it was 1917. 30 years had passed since the invention of the electric lamp. Edison had moved his laboratory to West Orange, New Jersey. He was 70 years old, but as active as ever. Recovering from the loss of his first wife, he had remarried happily. The flow of inventions had continued with hardly a pause. His library contained the finest private collection of scientific books in existence. There, Edison turned to a variety of scientific problems. His theories were tested in the laboratory, the most complete private laboratory in the world. Inventions had brought Edison great wealth, but to him, money was only the means to an end. He spent millions of dollars without a second thought on scientific research, and the results were astonishing. Experimenting, he developed the fluoroscope and gave it to the public without profit. He spent years creating a satisfactory storage battery and a system of ship-to-shore wireless telegraphy, the forerunner of radio. His deafness, the result of a boyhood injury, grew worse with the years. But no handicap could impede his genius. He devised machinery to improve the mixing of cement and the mining of iron ore. Then, with no previous experience in photography, he invented the first motion picture camera. His motion picture studio was the first in the world. Here, the world's first movies were made, some of them talkies, anticipating Hollywood by many years. Edison was the world's first movie fan. He was also, by now, the world's greatest inventor. In recognition, he received the Congressional Medal of Honor from Secretary of the Treasury, Andrew Mellon. Nearly 50 years had passed since the first electric lamp was lighted. You were 81 years old now, but still as active as ever. With your old friends, naturalist John Burroughs and Henry Ford, you went on camping trips. Gray-haired giants of industry and science, all three of you enjoyed competing in tests of strength. For you, after years of unending work, those camping trips with Ford and Burroughs were well-earned and welcome relaxation. In old age, you had learned how to pay. But it was always good to get back to the laboratory. The main thing in your life was science. You made only one concession to the advancing years. Winters were spent on your estate at Fort Myers, Florida. There you worked in a fine laboratory near your home. Henry Ford had pointed out that the rubber needed for automobiles was imported from abroad. In case of war, the supply might be cut off. Ford urged you to find a homegrown substitute for the foreign rubber plant. It was your latest project and your last. No let up. The day I'll retire, you said, will be the day before I die. And you expected to live to be a hundred. The search for a rubber substitute went on tirelessly. Near the laboratory, you raised plants of all kinds, testing them for rubber content. You discovered more than 600 American plants containing rubber. The best you found was native goldenrod. Cross-breeding goldenrod selectively, you produced varieties that were rich in rubber content. A few years more, you promised, and the problem of rubber would be solved. Time out from research on your 84th birthday to meet with reporters. What do you think of the Einstein theory? Uh, I don't think anything of Einstein's theory because I can't understand it. <laughs> what do you think of the sound uh, pictures to the, of today? Yes, what I think of the talking picture. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't know. I never heard one. <laughs> 
<laughs> How does it feel to be 84 years old? Well, it feels very fine to be 84 years of age. If you don't have anything, the matter with you. <laughs> well, I have a little trouble now and then, but that's because I'm getting old. But I'm not a lot of ginger yet. <laughs> a few months later, the old man passed away. And although the rubber project was never finished, he left a stupendous heritage. The great cities will forever bear his mark in subways and skyscrapers. His genius is in the modern phonograph. And in such common objects as the electric light, Edison made possible radio and television broadcasting. The electric train was his creation and improved concrete for bridges. Modern communications, his gift. And great dams transforming water power into electricity. Power stations sending electricity to turn the wheels of industry. Without Edison, it would have been impossible. Let there be light. The greatest miracle is perhaps that so much of modern living came from the brain of one man, Thomas Alva Edison.